You're listening to the Zach Gelb Show on Fox Sports 920, The Jersey. A lot of Sixers talk on this Tuesday, 609-919-D200. 5.15 is the time from the Prince and Orthopedic Associate Studios. This is the Zach Gelb Show. Let's go out to the hotline right now and welcome in Tom Moore. He covers the team on a daily basis for the Bucks County Courier Times and does a great job as always. And Tom is kind enough to hop on board with us right now. Tom, appreciate a few minutes. Thanks for the time. And how are you? Uh, fine, thanks, Zach. How are you? Well, I'm doing great, and we appreciate you coming on today on a very busy Tuesday. So let's get right into business with Joel Embiid because we've been talking about it all throughout the show. Uh, your feeling, your gut feeling on this, do you think that something gets done before uh, the end of October when it comes to an extension with Joel Embiid? Uh, I would say my uh, sense would be no, just because – uh, as you know, as tr- terrific as a player as he as he is, and skill set, and unique, and and all that stuff, you know, he's played in 31 out of 264 games the first three years. So if you commit, uh, and and I'm assuming he and his agent will want, you know, max money or near max money, which is about 100 million over four years and 130 or 130 million over five years. Um, so what they would do is. Uh, he's under contract for uh, seventeen eighteen. They picked up they picked up his fourth year option. I think it's six point eight million. Um, and then if they don't agree by uh, the start of the season in mid you know mid mid October, uh, we don't know the exact date yet. Um, uh, he would become a restricted free agent next July, and another team could theoretically sign him to an offer sheet. But the Sixers would have two days to match. So if, you know, if, if Embiid and, you know, his, uh, his uh, agents uh, would give a, you know, hometown discount or, you know, make a, a reasonable deal uh, in terms of given the, the risk, et, et cetera, you know, I, I would sh- sure think the Sixers would consider it. But it just seems to me that he's going to want max money, and I wouldn't blame him, but if I'm the Sixers, are you going to commit? That would that would start in 2018, 19. It would kick in, so you know you'd be on the hook for 100 million over four years, or 100 up to 130 over five years. And if you know, heaven forbid, that the injury issues continue and so on, um, that could really prevent you from signing other free agents and so on. Especially since in 2020, you're looking at Ben Simmons getting extended and Dario Saric, and then 2021 would be Markel Fultz. And a long-term deal with Embiid, he would still be under contract at that time. So, um, you know, I think it's certainly worth contacting and, and dialogue, but I just don't know that they're going to be able to find common ground yet because it, it's such an unknown in terms of um, his health. Just following up on that, because, and I totally get it, hey, Leon Rose and company and also Joel Embiid, they're going to want to get every penny possible, and they should be in that position when you come into negotiating. But just taking the other side of that argument, wouldn't it be the prudent business decision when your clients only played 31 games to take that hometown discount and just get uh, the years done out right now? I mean, possibly. I mean, that would be one way to approach it. But, you know, if you take the glass half full, um, view and he has a you know terrific year plays 60 or 65 games and averages 26 points and 11 rebounds and three and a half blocks and you know uh, then there's no question you know that he's a max guy so it there's risk either way if you lock in and there's more injuries um, better for Embiid and Leon Rose and on the other side um, if they wait um, and he you know, and he plays, uh, has a banner year, um, you know, you're going to be paying a max deal probably based on 17, 18. So, you know, the Sixers, I mean, they just have to do what they think is, you know, is right. He's, I mean, I've said it before, clearly he's the key to the whole thing, regardless of how good, you know, Simmons and Fultz and every, Sarge and everybody, you know, become, he is, he is the linchpin. He is the, uh, he is the number one guy. So it all kind of st- revolves around him. So there's no question he's important. And I, guess, I think the quote from Josh Harris um, Friday was that we're focused on Embiid's extension, uh, you know, as they should be. That's important. But they also have to be prudent and, you know, make a good business decision. 
As we all know, even if it gets past October 31st, he'd become a restricted free agent in the Sixers. There's still not a great risk there because they could still match the contract. But let's just say, and dare I say it because I don't want it to be the case, but if this guy gets hurt again and just knowing what happened off the uh, 31 games last year and seeing the potential but him not being able to stay healthy, uh, what do you try to speculate what happens in that case, not only uh, with the Sixers but around the rest of the league? How much would the interest level be if he gets hurt once again? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, you really don't know what to say because, you know, the team saw the 31 games last year and, and what he, you know, what he could do. Um, but by the same token to, you know, to risk, you know, tens of millions of dollars um, a year um, it is a lot, you know, you have to play uh, risk, you know, risk reward. Um, you know, I mean, uh, all it would take would be one team would have to give him a, you know, an offer sheet that he would sign and, and next summer. And then the Sixers would have two days to match. And you would think they would match. The only question would be if he has another injury plagued season, and somebody gives him a pretty big contract. That might be a tougher decision because you certainly want to do it and you want to keep him. Um, but you know, you're, you don't want it to be a Greg Oden type situation. I'm not saying it is, but you know, you, you, there's a lot of layers to this thing, and it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's. There's no easy solution, I think, on any, on any level. Tom Moore with us right now on the Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports 920, the Jersey. Uh, Tom, of course, covers Sixers for the uh, uh, covers the Sixers for the uh, Bucks County Courier Times. Uh, Tom, with them beads minutes going into this year, I know Colangelo talked about on national radio and then backtracked on it a little bit. How do you envision uh, his minutes being handled this year? You know, I I don't know. I think he'll probably be on a restriction. I uh, would be my guess, given everything last year and. Um, you know, coming off another surgery on the left knee, I think that, that that's probably the way it's going to start, whether there's, a, you know, whether there's still not playing in back-to-backs. I, I, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if that were the case um, because they aired on the side of caution in every instance last year except for that nationally televised Houston game on January 27th, which was turned out to be the last game played of the season. Um so yeah, there you know there's I mean last year it was 24 minutes to start the season, then 28, and uh, you know he missed the last two and a half months with another injury, you know through um, through hyperextending the knee and then the uh, the torn meniscus. So I don't think I mean if you're expecting to come out and play 36 minutes opening night and then two nights later play 36 minutes again or whatever, I don't know that that's going to be the case. With all the injuries that this team has suffered, and you saw how it were mishandled last year, in the offseason, uh, just with your insight on it, has there been any changes to the medical staff, and uh, where's the trust amongst the players uh, with the medical staff right now? Uh, I'm not aware of any, um, and, you know, I, I haven't heard anything from players, uh, you know, uh, of that, you know, ilk. Um, uh you know, I, I, I don't, yeah, I really don't know. Uh, I mean, it, Simmons and all that stuff, you know, with his, him, his apparently was that those January and February, those scans just showed that the foot wasn't healing because we were on the impression he, he would be back by the All-Star break. And I think the Sixers were kind of thinking that too. Uh, and it didn't happen. So uh, I, I don't know. I'm not aware of any changes. I know Brian Colangelo still, you know, was speaking highly of everybody and the and the you know the uh, the staff and all that stuff. So um, I don't know that anything is much different than a year ago. What did you make of the Rookie of the Year award announcement last night with Brogdon winning it? Yeah, it's a tough call. I mean, I I you know, I think you could make a pretty good case case for Sarge. Um, you know, having played 81 games and the way he improved as the season went on. Um, you know, with Ilyasova leaving um, uh, February 22nd, the day before the trade deadline, they dealt him to Atlanta. And then, you know, he had a bigger role and he produced, um, you know, played his best basketball at the end. Um, you know, Embiid is by far the most talented, it had the most impact, but I just don't think 31 games, which is fewer than 40% of their games, and he played less than 20% of the, the Sixers' total minutes on the season. I just don't think that's enough, even though he was, I mean, it was, wasn't even close to who the best rookie was, you know, for the first, uh, you know, four months of the season uh, that, you know, there was no doubt about it. 
Uh, Brogdon, you know, was on a better team, came off the bench. Ironically, you know, there were six Rookie of the Month in the Eastern Conference, and Bede won three, Search won two, and Willie Hernan Gomez, who the Sixers drafted and traded to the, uh, to the Knicks, a second-round pick, uh, was the winner in April. So he did not win a single month. Um, but was the but was the uh, was the pick? Um, he advanced that. His, a lot of his numbers were pretty good, uh, and you know, um, you know, and maybe a little bit of uh, Sarge and, and Embiid may have canceled each other a little bit. I'm, I don't know exactly, but I was not surprised. I thought he was a slight favorite going in, um, but then it was international media too, and you don't know with Sarge from Croatia and Embiid from Cameroon. You don't know how that factors into it. It's it, it was really tough to tell um, what was going to happen, really. I could have seen any of the three of them, but I did think Brogdon was a slight favorite, and Vegas had him as a slight favorite, too, and was correct. You got the feel yesterday that he was going to win the award. I wanted Sarge to win the award. I thought he should have won the award, and a big part of that is, like you just said so eloquently, that he didn't win uh, Rookie of the Month uh, even once this year in Brogdon. Uh, the enigma to me, though, is how much going away he won this award. It, it wasn't really that close as I thought it would be. Yeah, you just don't know. You don't know what people are looking at. It's not the best rookie. It's not, you know, the most uh, MVP. It was explained to me, you know, when I started on the beat, you know, almost 30 years ago, that MVP is most victories produced. That it's not the best player, um, but it's the guy who helps a good team be even better, essentially. Um, and I think there is, even though there's no there's no guidelines with the rookie of the year, and there's no minimum like you have to play, and I think it's 57 games to qualify to be the the scoring leader, et cetera, et cetera. Rookie of the year, there's no there's no minimum. Uh, Patrick Ewing won it with 50 games in 85, 86 his rookie year, and that's the lowest in an 80, full 82 game season of a guy winning rookie of the year. And I would have said even Embiid at 41, if he played 10 more half, I, I think you could have made a, you know a stronger case with him. Um, but I I just think that uh, yeah you know kind of a combination of factors, and he was kind of a uh, uh, I don't know like a, the horse that came up on the outside kind of thing, and then um, I guess people kind of looked at the analytic numbers and the and the um, and those types of things, and he did very well in some of those the efficiency numbers, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, ended up uh, winning the award. On the way out with Tom Moore right now from the Bucks County Courier Times. Uh, let me get your impressions so far, uh, early impressions of one Markel Fultz. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, uh, I, you know, I think that he, uh, I think he's the, you know, he's the guy, uh, Colangelo made the right move and got the guy who fits by far the best here whether Simmons is the point guard on offense or whether he's the point forward or whether he's the three or the four or whatever they consider him being, he can be the one, he can be the two, he can get to the basket, he can play on the perimeter, um, he can guard ones, he's six, four and a half, but his wingspan six and three quarters, he should be able to guard twos. Uh, you know, I, I just think he's, he was, everybody else had some sort of flaw, whether it's shooting issues or undersized or character, whatever they were. He was the one guy that kind of, you know, had all the, uh, as Brett Brown says, ticked all the boxes. So I just think that that was, um, and I mean, the best case scenario for, for the Sixers, if they're real lucky, you know, they keep the pick for the Lakers, whether it's number one or whether it's six through 30 next year. And if they're very lucky in 19 and the Sacramento pick is number one, they keep that. And if they're good by 19, you know, they could have ended up with number one pick for number three this year and you know, number 18 or number 20 in 2019, their own pick. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously that would take some luck. But, you know, I, I think it was the right move, and I was calling for it. But then I stopped for the two weeks before the draft. I just didn't see any way they would do it. And I thought, sure, Danny Ainge was going to keep the pick and, you know, take faults and then see what happens because Bradley and Isaiah Thomas are free agents next year. And I don't know if you want to pay – $30 million to Isaiah Thomas, a 5'9 point guard. So I could I could have seen if Fultz and Bradley worked out well for Boston, that would be your backcourt going forward, and you, just, you don't re-sign, you know, Isaiah Thomas. So I was surprised a little bit that he would make, you know, he would make that move. Um, but I think for the Sixers, it was the right move, and it was the best thing they could have done. And that's a thing to me, that you look at trading the number one overall pick and also to a divisional rival, too, 
uh, that could be a rival for many years to come if uh, you see some of the rumors with the Celtics, and it could be a part of a bigger puzzle here uh, with the Celtics, and they're looking to bring in Gordon Hayward and Paul George as Wojnowski has that report. I was just still surprised. I'm still scratching my head on this, the protections and, and how the Sixers got away with really not giving up that much, in my opinion, for that number one overall pick. Well, again, it, it could be, I mean, it could turn out to be that way, Zach, but it also could be the number two pick in the draft. I mean, the Celtics could have, they have the Nets pick again this year. Mm-hmm. This past year was a trade swap. Next year is just a trade, so they get the Nets pick. So, I mean, if, if, the, if the Nets pick is number one, you know, and the Nets should be one of the worst teams in the league, I would think Sacramento would be up there too. Um, and the Lake, Lakers pick ends up at number two, the the Celtics get one and two. Um, so, you know, they could really, they could add Porter and Doncic. They could package them. They could do all kinds of things uh, um, and really, you know, make a bigger splash or, or whatever. So um, it's, it's just so hard to tell. And it's tough for the Sixers, really, if they're going to trade, uh, make a trade involved in these. You don't know if you're making a trade, you know, you could make the trade. They could make it uh, – for the 19 pick that doesn't convey or for the Sixers own pick. If the, I mean, it's just so complicated. You still can make a move, but they might be trading one of the picks at 19 and to trade the other one would be very complicated. So, um, yeah, I, I was, I was, a uh, I was a bit surprised at the way it shook out and, and them taking Tatum, I guess they didn't really like Jackson, um, that much. They were concerned about a couple things and, you know, went with Tatum, uh, you know, a, a score, uh, mid range shooter. Before we let you run, talking about what's next in this process, you hit free agency. Uh, What do you anticipate free agency to look like for the Sixers and also in the the term of uh, J.J. Redick and uh, that topic? uh, What do you think it's going to take for the Sixers to be able to bring him in? It's really tough, Zach, because I don't know what you count Ben Simmons as, whether he's a you count him as a guard or forward. But if if, um, Corkmoss comes over as Brett Brown and uh, Brian Colangelo say that they think is likely – you have either six or seven guards on the roster, depending whether you count Simmons as a guard or a forward or whatever. So the roster now is top-heavy, not with big men, but with little guys. So I wrote a column for Sunday saying, you know, maybe the best move would be to go after somebody like Ursan Ilyasova because the only power forward they have on the roster right now is Dario Saric, um, depending what you count Simmons as, and Holmes can kind of play the four and the five. And you also need a backup big guy. So if Korkmaz comes over... Um, and you bring back Holmes and McConnell, which I would assume they would pick up their options, you're, that's 13 guys. You only have two more roster spots, full-time roster spots. So you need a shooter, but what if the shooter is a four? What if somebody like Ilya Sova, Sova who wants more, more years and more money than the Sixers are willing to pay, what if in, by July 8th there aren't a lot of big offers and maybe he's willing to play two years $25 million or two years $30 million here so you can preserve that long-term flexibility and cap space he would be your starting four. Um, Embiid likes playing with him. Uh, you know, he, he's a very good shooter. Um, he can play some five when you go small. He uh, draws a lot of charges. He, you know, he he's the, he shot thirty five percent from three last year. Uh, Sarge was thirty one. Sarge then could come off the bench, be the kind of key guy with your second unit. Um, you know, maybe that's the way, and that would be your fourteenth guy. Then your fifteenth, you sign kind of a veteran backup center um, because all you have right now at center is Embiid, uh, Holmes, and Okafor. Um, so you, you kind of need a guy that maybe you, you may need if there's an injury or something goes on, you need somebody who can play 15 or 20 minutes a game, maybe not every night, but to be available. So And that's your roster. That's why I, while I do like Redick, and I, I see that unless they can make a move and you know trade uh, Stauskas for a protected first-round pick or – you know, Wau Cabarro or whatever, you know, uh, Bayless, they have two more years of him, you know, under, under contract. So there's a lot of guards and um, a lot of bodies, and they're not all going to be able to play. Maybe four of them could play probably at, at the most. So they have some decision to make, decisions to make in terms of guys who played and started this past year may, may not only not be, play, not be starting, but they may not be playing in the regular rotation. And finally, uh, Tom, before we let you run, I just saw a note on Twitter Uh, that we just shared a few moments ago with the audience that uh, Robert Covington, who finished fourth in the Defensive Player of the Year, uh, finished ahead of LeBron James. So that's a steal of a deal coming up for this year. Just how about the future of uh, one Robert Covington? Well, uh, the way 
I guess to get he he is eligible now to get a theoretically a four year thirty nine million dollar deal. Um, he could get uh, the the Sixers qualified him uh, November fifteenth, which is the three year anniversary of him signing with the Sixers. He would be eligible for more money if they're looking for more money like that. To me, that that's that might I mean, he's been playing for a million dollars each year the, the past three years. Um, I think he got him and and McConnell and so on locked him up long term with some team options. So if they make the team, you have some salary control. But you know, for for what he does as a defensive, you know, he, he may be he'll be starting at the three probably, but he'll probably be guarding the other teams too, which is often their best scorer is is a two guard. Um, you know, I think that four years and thirty nine million might be a reasonable number if they would be willing to lock him up for that, if they think he is, whether it's a starter or a kind of first uh, wing off the bench, whatever it is long-term, you know, that he would seem to be a guy, you know, who would fit here long-term. He's six, nine. He can really, he can play some stretch four. He can guard ones, twos, and threes. Didn't shoot the ball as well last year as he had before, but defensively made some real strides. Um, you know, I think he's somebody that they want to have here long, you know, long-term and, they do have a chance to to lock him up, as I said, but between now and November fifteenth, for that amount of money, it's the most they could pay. So I'm sure they're having discussions, or will have discussions, you know, starting I guess Saturday is July first. Tom, great insight as always. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Let's do it again real soon. Thanks a lot, Zach. Take care.